All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our audience members uh, joining us on site, and also our viewers joining us online via Facebook live stream. Uh, my name is Russell Shaw. Uh, I am the executive director here at GTI. Um, okay. And um, GTI is a 501c3 think tank dedicated to Taiwan policy research. Our mission is to enhance the U.S.-Taiwan relationship by contributing to a more informed public discussion about Taiwan here in the United States and around the world. In pursuit of that mission, we undertake several major programs. Uh, they include the Global Taiwan Brief, which is a biweekly publication featuring timely analysis related to Taiwan. If you are an analyst, uh, journalist, academic, interested in contributing to the publication, please reach out to us. We also um, organize regular public seminars, like the one that we are, uh, that you are all participating in today, uh, to highlight uh, uh, timely issues related to Taiwan and facilitating discussion about issues related to Taiwan. Uh, we host an annual symposium uh, in the fall, uh, inviting leading policymakers to talk about U.S.-Taiwan relations. Uh, we also provide fellowship opportunities for American researchers to conduct short-term field research in Taiwan, as well as Taiwanese researchers to come to the United States to conduct short-term uh, field research. In addition to our more academic-oriented uh, programs, we also host uh, cultural programs, uh, and they have featured uh, movie nights and other uh, performances. So please stay tuned to our programs. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to receive our updates, you may do so on our website at www.globaltaiwan.org. Uh, before I begin, I would be remiss if I also did not acknowledge uh, the continued support from our board of uh, directors as well as advisors, some of whom are in this room today, uh, as well as our uh, hardworking staff, um, David, uh, Catherine, Marcia, and Jonathan, as well as our interns uh, for this semester, uh, Jack and uh, Vicky. Uh, obviously, their contribution to our uh, daily operations is uh, essential, and um, you know we thank them uh, very much for their continued uh, uh, support for our work. So let's begin today's program. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, a dear personal friend and advisor to GTI, which means he gets to a lifetime supply of sandwiches when he comes to <laughs> GTI events. Uh, Dr. Toshi Yoshihara is truly one of this country's leading thinkers on Chinese enabled strategy. I've had the pleasure of working with and learning from Toshi about all things the PLA Navy in various capacities for nearly a decade, uh, especially when I served as editor of the Jamestown Foundation's China Brief. Uh, I know that he has had a profound influence in not only my thinking and analysis about Chinese military strategy, but many other young China, uh, PLA watchers as well, and I consider myself young. Um, Toshi is currently a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment, an independent nonprofit think tank uh, specializing in U.S. defense policy, force planning, and budgets. Uh, before joining CSBA, Toshi held the John A. Van Buren Chair of Asia-Pacific Studies at the U.S. Naval War College, where he taught strategy for over a decade. Um, he has also been a visiting professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Today, we are here to talk about the second edition of his co-authored book, Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy. If you haven't already picked up your copy, we have them available for purchase at a discounted price on site for um, $30. And, um, and a shout out to our, uh, our partner, the U.S. Naval Institute Press, for being on site to uh, provide uh, copies of the books. And so um, Toshi has graciously agreed to stay uh, a little later after the event to sign copies. So make sure you sign, uh, purchase your copies. Um, Toshi and his co-author Jim Holmes combine a near encyclopedic knowledge of Asia's maritime space with an ability to tap into Chinese language uh, sources uh, and expertise in sea power theory to assess how the rise of Chinese sea power will affect U.S. maritime strategy in Asia. 
Uh, as a measure of how incredibly well researched uh, this book is, you can simply refer to the number of endnotes uh, that are in this book, and, and I counted it: uh, 488 endnotes, and most of which are all Chinese language sources. Um, at that, and I think that's the key. The first edition was listed uh, on the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program. Uh, if that is not enough, uh, the book has won enormous praise uh, worldwide, and. Um, so we are very delighted to have Toshi today, um, here today to share with us some of his findings from this uh, second edition. So uh, welcome, Toshi. Um, like I like to do with um, uh, of these book events is I like to start off with some more general and uh, openers. Um, and, um, and this is a question I like to ask um, all our sort of authors that join us. And as an aspiring author, a book author myself, I'm always intrigued by what really motivated you know, um, to, uh, people to take on such a Herculean task of writing a book. And um, so, so if you will, uh, Toshi, uh, what motivated you to uh, write Red Star Over the Pacific? Sure. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Russell, for that very kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure for me to be here to talk to you about uh, the second edition of Red Star Over the Pacific. Um, so, as to your question about what motivated us to write the book, uh, Jim Holmes, my longtime friend and colleague and co-author, and I um, followed Chinese naval affairs for about a decade before we started writing uh, the book in the, back in the summer of 2009. It's hard to believe that al almost 10 years have passed since, since we started on the manuscript. Um, we basically wanted to make a fairly straightforward argument that China's turn to the seas uh, will be a permanent phenomenon in Asian politics uh, and that China is not going to vacate the seas anytime soon, that it's going to be a permanent complicating factor for Asia but also for U.S. maritime strategy. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we went beyond hardware. I think there's plenty of studies out there that does the bean counting, you know, counting the number of holes, talking about capabilities. Um, what we wanted to do was really to get into the intellectual roots of Chinese maritime strategy and Chinese sea power. Uh, when the first edition came out, um, I think that um, it, it's, in some ways, the novelty of the argument attracted a lot of attention. But I think it's also a testament to just how far the Chinese have come in terms of their capabilities and so forth, that I think a lot of the things that we said both in the first edition, but also in the second edition, have become very much part of the lexicon, you know, very much part of the vocabulary and the conversation. Um, but for the second edition, I think we did far more than simply update the first edition. In fact, I would say about 70% of the content in the second edition is entirely new to, to the book. Um, now, certainly a lot has changed over the past decade. In fact, it's amazing how much has changed uh, in terms of Chinese naval power over the past decade. So we certainly wanted to capture that transformation. But I think above all, we really wanted to double down on this idea that there are some really powerful structural forces that are driving China in the seaward direction. Uh, and that China's here to stay. China's not going anywhere in the maritime domain. And that we had better compete and respond in earnest in this emerging competition. And we also wanted to, finally, to, to um, answer this question is that we wanted to be much more explicit in this edition in framing uh, why China's turning to the seas. And so we made a much more explicit effort in talking about China's turn to the seas in the context of Chinese grand strategy, something hopefully we'll be able to talk about later. Great. Thank you very much, Toshi. And on that note about why China's turning to the sea, um, you know, the influence of American naval uh, historian Alfred Thayer Marhan on U.S. naval strategy is unquestionable. But you and Jim, uh, in your co-author book, um, argue persuasively of how, how Mahan has influenced how Chinese naval strategists uh, view sea power. Can you explain in just a few minutes, and not to give away the entire book, of course, um, to our audience through uh, Mahan's view of sea power and how that shaped Chinese naval strategists and how they view the maritime space, maritime strategy, and naval strategy? Yeah, so uh, for those of you um, not familiar with Alfred Thayer Mahan, uh, he was an advocate for American sea power uh, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. He's considered basically the modern founder of sea power theory. He really laid out the foundational theories of sea power, and many of his larger points remain relevant to this day. In fact, his most famous book, uh, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 
uh, remains a required reading uh, at the Naval War College where I taught for over a decade. And so um, I, in fact, interacted with many naval officers uh, through, through um, Mahan's book. Uh, and I think what's, what got us started on this was just this our encounters with Chinese academics at conferences where, and we're talking about 15 years ago in the early 2000s, um, where Chinese academics were quoting him left and right, referring to him and using frequently the most sort of bloody-minded aspects of, of his writings. And it was the apparent intellectual embrace of Mahan's writings that got us interested uh, in, in Chinese sea power in the first place. And I think it was fascinating to us that the Chinese were so engaged in this long dead and in, in, and in certain circles long forgotten Western theorists on sea power. Uh, just to give you a sense of um, how resonant uh, Mahan remains to this day, uh, I have more than a dozen Chinese translations of the influence of sea power alone. Different translations and summaries of Mahan's writings sitting on my bookshelf right now all of them published in the past 10 years. And there are many more, in fact. I mean, you can, you can have a, a long-running bibliography of Chinese translations of uh, Mahan's various books. Um, I think what was even more interesting, it seemed to me at the time, was an apparent intellectual divergence, which is that um, we Americans, of course, uh, have taken sea power very much for granted, particularly in the post-Cold War period the idea that we could command the seas, that we would dominate the commons. You know, a lot of that, of course, was reflected in policy documents throughout the 2000s. Uh, you know, and I think that attitude about the maritime domain, I think, stood in sharp contrast at the time when the Chinese seemed to be gorging themselves on, on these classical ideas that Mahan articulated. And so we simply wanted to explore why. You know, why is it that there is this sudden interest and fascination with Mahan, with Mahan that I think persists to this day. Um, now, I think it's important to know that, the, the, that we've documented both the uses and abuses of Mahan's writings in China. Um, that, in fact, scholarship on Mahan it was and it remains uneven, depending on uh, whose writings you're reading. Um, but I think over the years, what I have witnessed is certainly a growing sophistication about his writings, uh, and that in fact there's now some pushback, uh, you know, and in in saying in fact that maybe we should step back and rethink the actual strategic relevance of Mahan for China's circumstances. In fact, a book just came out, published by a professor uh, at Peking University. It's called, uh, I think, Chinese Sea Power in the Post-Mahanian Age. So there's clearly already somebody who's saying, look, you know, we've got to think, be, you know, think beyond Mahan. And I think that's all to the good. And I think that serves as a baseline for tracking the intellectual development in China when it comes to sea power theory. Uh, and, and I think looking back 15 years ago, I, I think China's initial interest in Mahan was just a function of China's uh, – and a recognition of China's growing dependence on seaborne commerce – for China's long-term economic well-being. And so it's never a bad thing to turn to the great books, to the classics for, for guidance. But I think for the book, for the second edition, we make a broader point. I think this is an even more important point than how many you know, Chinese translations there are of Mahan's book, which is that you need not have read Mahan at all to be a Mahanian. What I mean by that is that Mahan really helped to point to some of the underlying principles, enduring principles of sea power uh, that are in some ways universal. He was, he was among the first in, in, in the modern era to uncover and systematically assess those enduring principles. But he certainly didn't invent them, right? Those principles existed before him. In fact, you can say those principles uh, existed in antiquity when Athenian sea power emerged in the ancient Greek world. Uh, and, and, and so the point we were trying to make really today is that whenever the maritime domain begins to possess strategic meaning to any power that's turning to the seas, um, those principles apply. And therefore, our point is simply that China is following those principles. It's no different from any of the predecessors who've sought to use the seas to generate wealth and power. Well, along the lines of uh, long dead but uh, not forgotten um, you know, theorist, uh, in your book you've also uh, referred to the Prussian military theorist Clausewitz. Uh, 
uh, who famously stated that war is an extension of political intercourse by other means. Uh, and you wrote, um, wars of perception can yield real results. Um, can you explain this concept in layman terms and how it applies to what you see as, uh, as Chinese maritime and naval strategy today? Sure. Um, this idea about war of perceptions at sea is simply to remind the readers that the trial of strength does not necessarily only involve combat at sea. It's not the physical exchange of firepower that, that signifies uh, the competition or the rivalry. That we are in fact at sea competing constantly in peacetime. Uh, so military hardware that's revealed on TV, in newspapers, in social media, uh, when the Chinese show off their hardware in these massive military parades, they, those things can have a tangible impact on the way we assess, we estimate, uh, and judge uh, Chinese military power, uh, both to perceive them, but potentially also to misperceive them, meaning we could underestimate or overestimate uh, China just based on what they show us, right? Um, and so when China shows off its new missiles or its new ships, those images affect the way we assess and estimate Chinese military power. And in fact, you can even apply this in terms of our peacetime encounters with the Chinese at sea, right? So when we encounter a Chinese, a modern surface combatant in the South China Sea, that's going to affect the way we evaluate and assess Chinese power. Uh, again, either for good or for ill. Uh, Chinese anti-piracy patrols in the Indian Ocean, a classic constabulary peacetime mission, uh, and the things that they've learned uh, over the past 10 years, uh, again, it's remarkable, right, to think that China has been operating on a virtually uninterrupted basis in the Indian Ocean for over a decade now. Uh, that is going to affect the way we think about Chinese naval power, or the fact that the Chinese are now regularly sorting throughout the Western Pacific. That also affects the way we think about Chinese naval power. Um, when the Chinese apparently very methodically and progressively pursuing their carrier program, that tells us something about China's strategic will to the seas. There's obviously debate whether it's going well or not and how successful the Chinese will be, but nevertheless, the fact that they're plugging along tells us something. Uh, I, again, whether that helps us to perceive Chinese sea power better or, or misperceive it, that's up for debate. When the Chinese proudly announce that a naval sortie has broken through the first island chain, or that a Chinese air patrol has conducted an encirclement sortie around Taiwan. Uh, I think all of those things are peacetime activities designed to shape perceptions of Chinese power. It's, 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 I, I, I use the term coercive posturing to describe this, which is the use of the military instrument in peacetime to influence not only perceptions, but also to bend China's opponents to China's will. Um, so at a minimum, these things can have uh, all sorts of effects, right? It could simply change your mind about the current state of the competition. Um, we could, and I've, I think I've witnessed this, uh, certainly at the Naval War College, a newfound respect for the Chinese advances at sea. We could get more worried about the larger strategic balance. We could be intimidated. Our allies could be intimidated. We could be cowed into risk aversion. I mean, there are all sorts of strategic effects that, that that could occur. So again, it's just a reminder to everybody that this isn't just about a scenario in which gray holes are firing missiles at each other. This is as much about what the Chinese are trying to shape our perceptions today, right now, in peacetime. If I can pull that thread a little bit and sort of put a, 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 a sort of bumper sticker over it, uh, is that in recent years there's been a lot more talks about China's gray zone operations, mm -hmm. right? Um, actions that fall below the threshold of military conflict, and, and your former colleague, you colleagues at the Naval War College, Andrew Erickson, has been really instrumental, I think, in shaping the public the discourse on China's maritime militia. Uh, and for the longest time, the U.S. did not really seem to have a response uh, to these types of tactics. Um, what is the distinction between wartime and peacetime confrontations? And, your, and then you apply this concept of armed suasion, which I, I thought was really uh, interesting and novel. Um, and has Chinese actions of blurring the lines made this distinction with really no real difference, actually, between peacetime and, and wartime? Um, what do you think is the appropriate U.S. response? And I'm, I'm going I'm to pack on a lot more stuff here, but what are the roles of allies and partners? Sure. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I think um, one way to think about Chinese sea power and the way we've described it is to think about Chinese sea power in terms of a national fleet. 
it's a term that we use as well. And, and, and the bumper sticker, I think, in the Chinese context, the Chinese version of the national fleet is that anything that floats is an implement of Chinese sea power. Uh, that means fishing boats, Coast Guard cutters, uh, lower end uh, combatants, and even oil rigs and so forth can be considered elements of Chinese sea power. Um, I would add that uh, China's infrastructure prowess, including its ability to build man-made islands in the middle of the South China Sea, uh, or uh, China's bases, both commercial and military, along China's long coastline, are all the physical manifestations of Chinese sea power. The fact that they can build more of that infrastructure close to the areas that they care about is a kind of what I would, you know, what I've already called coercive posturing, right? Uh, it puts them closer to the scene of action. Uh, those features in the middle of the South China Sea gives China a foothold in the heart of that body of water where China didn't. Um, and in fact, in my conversations with Chinese interlocutors in the past, it's interesting that they were very proud of the fact that China had that uh, technical and infrastructural ingenuity to uh, turn sand into islands. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's a feature of their sea power. But they're also intangibles, whether it's China's uh, expansive interpretations of international law, its expansive maritime jurisdictional claims, its imposition of the air defense identification zone in the East China Sea, the use of media and diplomacy. I think all of those non-military instruments of power are part of this larger context. So I would urge the audience and the readers to, to, to really think about Chinese sea power in these comprehensive terms that it's also about the use of the non-military instruments of national power in the maritime domain that, that should be part of the equation. Now, gray hold ships, the warships are clearly very important, but they only form one part of, of, of a larger instrument um, at sea. So we make the argument uh, in the book that when we're talking about, say, the term anti-access that's gained popularity, uh, we typically think of th those in military terms, right? How, how does China seek to use its military instrument to uh, keep U.S. forces or allied forces at, at arm's length through anti-access weaponry? Um, but uh, so, it, it, so we're thinking about anti-access in quintessentially military terms, but I think it's also th useful to think about anti-access in the broadest terms, right? That all of those various instruments of sea power can be used to shrink our room for maneuver, or at least to, to sow doubt in the minds of decision makers that we have room for maneuver in these very various maritime spaces. Um, what China is doing in the East China Sea is certainly seeking to uh, shrink Japan's sense of its space in that domain, S and, and it's happening uh, in peacetime. And so I think uh, this idea that um, China is thinking about the application of sea power to uh, get its way both in peacetime crisis and war, I think is really important. And so in response, I think we similarly then need to have a broad conception of sea power and maritime strategy. And we have to, in some ways, get used to this idea of a perpetual struggle, that there isn't, in fact, a clear line that divides peace, peace and war. Or to, put, to, to uh, go back to Clausewitz, right, to, to uh, put it in Clausewitzian terms, or to turn the Clausewitzian terms on its head, is that China is waging war by other means. Right. Um, in, in fact, we can go to Mao Zedong. Right. You know, Mao Zedong uh, very famously said uh, that uh, politics is war without bloodshed, while war is politics with bloodshed. In other words, politics or peacetime interactions is simply another manifestation of struggle and contest, and that requires us, I think, to think in similar ways and therefore to seek ways to push back across the board. Ac across all implements of national power, not just in the n in the narrow naval domain. I mean, the relevance of your book, um, you know, extends beyond just you know the immediate sort of um, assessment on uh, China's or the longer term assessment on China's naval strategy, but it's also application to what is clearly now being identified by the the, the U.S. government uh, through the 2017 uh, U.S. national security strategy, which you know warns that you know the future landscape of is uh, is great power competition, and uh, so so how does the rise of Chinese sea power uh, factor into this uh, new competitive landscape that you've uh, clearly uh, outlined in your book? 
Yeah, so um, consistent with the national security strategy, I'm going to draw from the national defense strategy because I think it uses some uh, um, evocative uh, terms to describe this uh, great power competition. And it, it, it depicts China as employing what it says an all-of-nation strategy or all-of-nation approach that, again, employs all, uh, all elements of national power to achieve its its objectives, and that includes not only military modernization, but predatory economic behavior, as well as influence operations. And we can see how these three broad pillars, military modernization, predatory economic behavior, and influence operations intersect with things that are happening in the maritime domain. If you might recall, the New York Times did an expose on uh, China's uh, quote-unquote debt trap diplomacy in Sri Lanka. Uh, that uh, enabled China to acquire a 99-year lease on Hambantota. Um, what, what was interesting about that was that it seemed like it touched a nerve. <laughs> it, it touched the Chinese nerve because they pushed back vociferously. And I think when they're pushing back that hard, you know that you're doing something right. right? And, and, and so here we have a good example of using economic tools in order to pry open uh, access in the maritime domain. Or if you think about uh, China's growing influence operations in, in the South Pacific, even along the second island chain in Saipan, where they're trying to insinuate themselves with local populations, uh, some have called this not just an attempt to enhance China's influence in the region, but it's also, in a, in a very geostrategic sense, to drive a salient into the U.S. position uh, in, in the Pacific. Again, taking uh, these activities taking place in an intensely maritime domain that could have implications for our strategy. So I think um, you can see where what, what the NDS is talking about is you know, directly applicable to what China is doing in the maritime domain. And at the, um, the CCP's 19th Party Congress in the fall of 2017, uh, Xi Jinping stated that you know, PLA modernization will be basically completed by 2035 and that by 2050, the PLA will have a fully transformed into a world-class force, uh, one that is you know, capable of deterring with defeating potential adversaries and, expand, uh, and supporting China's global interests. This timeline also coincides with the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation uh, by 2049. Um, and so and the question here is, how, how does sea power, or what will sea power, uh, Chinese sea power, fulfill these China dream? Yeah, and I think that's one of our uh, key arguments that um, Chinese sea power should not be thought of as a sort of an independent project of its own, that it's very much tied to China's long-term plans. And we use the China dream, in fact, as a proxy for thinking about what China wants over the long term and how Chinese sea power fits into it. So the two are intimately related. Um, it, you know, it's, um, it's important to note that um, Xi Jinping himself considers Chinese naval power as a as a as a key instrument, uh, and that um, it's it's part of this timeline of of uh, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, but also part of the timeline to build uh, the PLA into a world class military. Uh, it was in May of 2017, actually five months before the 19th Party Congress, that Xi Jinping uh, explicitly called uh, on the naval cadre to think about uh, building a powerful navy that fulfills this, this dream of a, a world-class military. And then he repeats this again, uh, most prominently in April of 2018, during that massive naval parade, I think the, the largest in recent history, uh, in which again, uh, Xi Jinping calls explicitly for the, ser for the naval service to become a world-class navy. Um, so clearly, the, the, the navy's place in that timeline, in that long-term goal, is, is, has, has, has been established. Um, as I mentioned briefly, the, the China dream ultimately is about, and it, unlike projects of other nations, is to, to, to become wealthier and to become more powerful, right? It's about wealth and power. And the, the underlying principles of sea power, as we argue in the book, is about obtaining access to seaborne commerce, maintaining the political will to sustain uh, the, the, the strategic will to the seas, and the military means, particularly naval power, to defend China's interests in the maritime domain. And that those, those various instruments or those various factors are essential for the generation of Chinese wealth and power over the long term. In fact, uh, 
we argue in the book that this connection between, China, between the China dream and sea power arguably goes all the way back to Deng Xiaoping, who was the architect of reform and opening up. Um, he foresaw uh, the importance uh, and the connection between reform and opening up, um, which is the key to sea power, I mean the key to wealth and power, to sea power, right? He saw that connection, that in order to succeed in the reform and opening up project, he understood that China was going to be increasingly dependent on seaborne commerce, right? A again, as a part of this ability to rise or re-rise. Um, and therefore, he understood that China needed a coherent maritime strategy and the foundations of sea power uh, to, uh, to pursue reform and opening up. So that connection was made clear, really, in, in, in the earliest stages of the reform and opening up. In fact, um, I have a quote in the book uh, that as early as August of 1979, uh, Deng said to the naval cadre, so that's what, f uh, how many years ago? 40 years ago, right? Uh, 40 years ago, Deng said to the naval cadre in really evocative terms, the seas are no longer a moat. We cannot think of the seas as a moat by implication. Because of reform and opening up, we have to see the seas as a highway for trade, for commerce, and so forth. And that that is our path towards development and essentially national rejuvenation. And that there is no turning back. I mean, those were the words that he used to describe this long-term maritime project. So I think Xi's China dream, although far more ambitious uh, than uh, Deng's vision, uh, is in some ways a continuation of that initial trajectory, which is this recognition that China's long-term fate is tied to the seas. Now, uh, China dream, this idea of the China dream also sees China re-emerging as a great power, right? To become a co-equal co among other um, great powers. By, by implication, it seems to me, that means that China would um, re-emerge at the epicenter of East Asian international politics. And a, another implication one could draw from that is that that would mean a substantial reduction of American power and influence in the region. Um, in fact, the national defense strategy forcefully argues that what China wants is regional dominance and the displacement of the United States, right? And uh, so if that were the case, if you, if you accept that hypothesis, uh, then the extent that Chinese sea power can be used to nudge or muscle the United States out of the region, then sea power is clearly part of this end goal in the China dream. Um, I think the China dream also has a... Taiwan, I think, connection as well. Um, implicit in the statements about the China dream is that part of the re rejuvenation process is that Taiwan must come back into the fold. That by the, 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 the implication is that China would never be whole or complete without Taiwan. And therefore, the rejuvenation process necessarily entails the, the completion of quote-unquote unification. And so again, to the extent that Chinese sea power helps to fulfill that goal, then certainly Chinese sea power is an, an integral part of the China dream. Well, given that uh, the name of our organization is the Global Taiwan Institute, we certainly have to have a, a Taiwan component to our discussion here. I'm, I'm glad, Toshi, that you uh, brought that up. And, and, because, and, and there are elements within uh, the various chapters of your book, and, and, and really um, just want to do another plug here, that if you do, haven't purchased a copy, please do so, because it's so rich in, um, in, 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 the, in the content and the depths. Uh, that we're really just scratching the surface here with uh, Toshi's um, um, very eloquent uh, description of the of, of the main points. But one chapter that really stood out to me uh, was the chapter on Chinese sea power in the Missile Age. Um, this perhaps has the most immediate and perhaps direct impact uh, effect on the U.S. Navy over a potential Taiwan scenario. Uh, in particular, the Chinese development of uh, ASCMs, ASBMs, and its uh, emerge, uh, developing A2AD AD capabilities. Can you share with the audience the findings of that chapter? Uh, yeah. Some of, the, some of the findings. Sure. So um, this chapter is actually one of my favorite chapters of the book, um, and it partly because it was the most translation-intensive chapter of the entire book. I mean, it's in, I, I think um, almost 90% of the endnotes were uh, original Chinese translations by me. Um, and I surveyed hundreds of Chinese doctrinal sources and authoritative technical uh, writings to, to, to finish this chapter. And I think what I found in that chapter was 
just a broad observation that the Chinese are good students of, of, of history and theory, that they do invest a lot of intellectual energy in looking back to history and drawing lessons learned. Uh, and uh, they've gone back to uh, sort of the earliest phases of the Missile Age, uh, talking about the encounters between the Israeli and the Egyptian Navy in 1967 as the, as the first sort of missile duel in the modern era. Uh, and trying to draw some lessons from from those encounters, um, and so I was I was always sort of impressed with, um, I guess, the studiousness of of uh, Chinese strategists. Um, but I think what was also really interesting about uh, my reading of the literature is that they were able to very clearly discern what they see as the main characteristics of naval combat in the future, and that. They envision such combat to be extremely intense, extremely lethal, extremely violent, and short. Uh, they foresee all types of advanced weaponry, uh, sy uh, missile systems delivered by multiple services, by multiple combat arms, um, and that it would often involve long-range, over-the-horizon precision strike missiles. Uh, it's, a, it's what someone's called a projectile-centric strategy. Uh, and that they foresee both sides, um, both, both, both naval combatants seeking a quick, decisive uh, engagement at sea. So you can imagine it's essentially both sides armed with all sorts of long-range precision strike weaponry and in the encounter, a spasm of missile strike and missile counter strike. Uh, one article that I cite uh, envisions uh, the, you know, an exchange of over hundreds of missiles within a period of sh like 10 minutes, I think is what they estimated, that each side would launch hundreds of missiles at each other in an encounter that would last 10 minutes. And by implication, what that means is that you could conceivably lose a, your, your fleet in an afternoon, right, given the lethality and the precision of these uh, missiles. And what's also interesting, and it's consistent with the conversations we're having in the United States, which is that these technological trends in missile lethality and precision uh, have pushed each side to think about how to land the first blow, how to strike first, uh, because uh, if not to think preemptively about sea combat, because the conclusion is that it's really the side that um, launches the first strike or you know, delivers the first punch and lands the first blow that will have the higher probability of seizing the battlefield initiative. And you know, again, this is not um, inconsistent with our tactical writings, just ask Wayne Hughes, right? You know, he's, the, he's one of the towering authorities on this, and he's, he, you know, he certainly has argued that that's, that's the character of future naval warfare. So, um, so I think the Chinese have gotten into thinking, I think, in very concrete terms about what sea combat would look like in a conventional uh, high-end um, realm. Um, so and to relieve the reader of any doubt that when the Chinese are talking about naval high-end combat that they're talking about us, they're talking in part about confronting us, uh, is that um, I cite multiple articles in which the Chinese uh, use the U.S. Navy as the standard metric. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of their favorite mock targets in their experiments in these articles is the workhorse of the U.S. Navy, the R.A. Burke destroyer. Uh, and I've come across multiple articles talking about what kinds of missile tactics, the volume of missile salvos, whether it's air launched or sea launched or submarine launched in order to overwhelm the organic defenses or the fleet defenses of the US surface fleet. Uh, one study, for example, just to give you more details here, is that um, it, it's interesting that this study, first of all, has in its title something like, you know, how to defeat the fleet defenses of the Arleigh Burke destroyer. It's like it's in the title, right? It's it's not um, it's not implicit. It's it's very explicitly about thinking about defeating the organic fleet defenses of a major U.S. combatant. And what the authors conclude was that if you had uh, two uh, high altitude uh, supersonic anti-ship cruise missiles coming in at the ship in different directions. If you have two uh, sea skimming supersonic anti-ship cruise missiles coming at the ship in different directions, and if you plop on top of that an anti-ship ballistic missile, which is a shore-based missile that travels along a ballistic trajectory to hit a moving target at sea, they say that there, there's a very high probability that one of those pr projectiles or missiles will get through. I mean, really, you know, specific tactical details about how you defeat uh, U.S. fleet defenses. What was 
in my view, the most interesting detail was when the article was published. It was published in 2002. And that's seven to eight years before the whole anti-ship ballistic missile buzz started to take hold here in Washington. Uh, so my point there was simply that not only are the Chinese thinking seriously, in my view, about high-end combat uh, against uh, a, a, a powerful adversary like the United States, but that they've been thinking hard about this for quite some time. Well, and to carry on this conversation about Chinese views and the literature that you've read and have analyzed um, uh, with, with so much care, it's, um, is this concept also of, of island chains. And, uh, and this figures very prominently in a lot of, I know, in Chinese writings. And, um, and so, so could you maybe sort of highlight for us uh, how does the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and, and Taiwan um, you know, figure into this island chain strategy that, uh, that, that China has or appears to have? Yeah, so, um, so the island chain is basically a part of China's strategic geography. Uh, the first island chain, for those of you who are not familiar, is a transnational archipelago that, depending on who you ask, uh, the most expansive version stretches from the Aleutians down through the Kirao, through Japan, through Ryukyu, through Taiwan, through the Philippines, and wends its way westward through the Indonesian archipelago. Um, in fact, um, that, is the, that is the definition that Liu Huaqing, who is considered the founder of the modern Chinese Navy, uses in a footnote in his selected military writings. That's, that's how he defines the scope uh, of the first island chain. Um, in, in its most simplest terms, it's seen as a, as a kind of a geographical metric for how far the Chinese Navy should project power, not only out to the first island chain, but, but beyond. Um, it's frequently described as a physical barrier to China's maritime ambitions. But I think it, it's, those factors are important, but they're less important than these larger strategic factors that, that the island chain represents, what they symbolize. The first one is that the island chain, and there are sep there's actually more than one, since there's a first island chain, there are, there are others, um, is that they are, the f in some ways, the physical manifestation of American military power, the architecture of American military power in the Western Pacific. So there's the first island chain that I've already described. There's the second island chain that runs from Japan down through the Marianas. Uh, there's the third island chain, which is centered on the Hawaii Islands. And then uh, sometimes you, you'll hear informally about a fourth island chain, which is really... Um, st stretching a little bit, but it's talking about the American West Coast. But the, but, but, but the point of those, those lines, if you will, uh, is that they symbolize the architecture of American military power. Because what they're concerned about, about the island chain, are the U.S. naval bases and other military bases, right? They, and the first island chain, it's symbolized by U.S. forward presence on Japan. Uh, the second island chain, of course, Guam, a major hub of American military power. The third island chain, of course, is Hawaii. And the reason they stretch it to talk about the fourth island chain on the American West Coast is San Diego, another hub of American naval power. So when you're sitting in Beijing looking out across these island chains, I think, visually speaking, what you see are concentric rings of American military power that stretches from the American homeland right into China's backyard. Um, and I think this, in some ways, informs, uh, in, in my interpretation of the writings, a sense of claustrophobia, that they're kind of closed off behind uh, these, these uh, island chains. But it's, it's not just the fact that uh, it's about strategic military issues, but there's also a geoeconomic component. Uh, the reality is that the, the first island chain in particular forms a series of narrow seas and choke points through which commercial and military shipping uh, have to pass through in order to reach the open waters of the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. And the fact that um, the occupants of the first island chain who occupy commanding positions over the approaches to the narrow seas and choke points are all formal allies or at a minimum friends or even close friends of the United States. That reality doesn't sit well with China as well. So there's a geoeconomic component to it. Uh, um, this idea that a hostile coalition of forces can close China off from access to the seas to the reality that the, the first island chain in particular represents a series of um, American alliance um, uh, systems or allied architecture uh, that, uh, that is just off of China's shores. So I think those are the sort of the strategic, geoeconomic, and the alliance dimensions or what, what, it, what the island chain means to China. I think that's, 
more important than the fact that it's some kind of an operational line for the for the Chinese Navy. Um, but to talk about like what this means in particular on Taiwan, uh, I think this is this has been fairly controversial. There there really isn't much consensus about how important is Taiwan in the context of the first island chain, the geostrategic significance of Taiwan within the context of the first island chain. But we cite, again, Chinese writings, some of them fairly authoritative, um, that considers China the, I mean, Taiwan the central link because just of its geographical location. It's in some ways at the epicenter of the first island chain. And that were China to uh, get Taiwan back, then that would cut the island chain in half um, and one Chinese analyst that we quote calls Taiwan the the front door to the Pacific or the front gateway to the Pacific. So in that sense, taking Taiwan would breach uh, the first island chain, uh, which I think you can see it as a, a great wall in reverse, right? The first island chain is a series of um, American-inspired or American-supported sentinels designed to stand in the way of China's ambitions, right? Maritime ambitions. So if you can take Taiwan, then you kind of break you, you, you create a breach through this a Great Wall in reverse. This would give China direct and open access to the Pacific. It would give China a commanding position to the north of the South China Sea. It would give China a commanding position over the north-south communications for Japan, um, and so forth. Uh, and that this could, in fact, change Japan's strategic calculus, because it would, it would, it would alter the security equation for for Japan, and by implication, give China leverage over Japan also in in its regional competition um, with with Japan. And, and so there are all of these um, geostrategic factors that have been explicitly addressed by by Chinese analysts. Um, and, and again, you know, we can you know we can we can agree or disagree about the actual geostrategic importance of Taiwan, but the fact that Chinese analysts think about it in those terms is something that we should, you know, we should take into consideration. And I think one, one other thing is, you know, in a, in a unification scenario, um, what would happen if the PLA were to deploy different types of anti-access forces and so forth uh, to the island? Um, again, there's considerable debate about to what extent that could ha have an influence on the larger strategic balance. But I think the more important point is simply th that we, we do have to consider the fact that Chinese analysts certainly uh, see geostrategic value to the island and what kind of benefits it would accrue to China from a geostrategic perspective if Taiwan were to fall into China's hands. Last question before I open it up to uh, audience Q&A. The Indo-Pacific is a very catchy phrase now that's often used um, all over the place, and it's often described as a maritime theater, uh, which would logically necessitate a maritime or uh, naval strategy. Uh, what is your assessment of Taiwan's role in the United States free and open Indo-Pacific strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Taiwan is a undoubtedly a maritime trading nation, and that means that Taiwan shares the same kinds of values about having um, open access um, to, to the maritime domain. Um, of course, the maritime domain, and maritime Asia in particular, um, is, is considered a commons, right? So it's, it's a public good that's available to all. Um, the commons is a fundamentally positive sum game. Um, you can think of the commons as a public park, right? Uh, the additional participation of someone else in the public park does not diminish access and enjoyment of the same public park to others that are already there. And we can, we can think about the maritime domain in those positive sum game. Uh, and in that sense, I think uh, Taiwan and other maritime stakeholders in the current order uh, share the same values, share the same hope for the sustainment of the norms that have underwritten what, what we call the international liberal order. So um, I think Taiwan's, um, just by Taiwan's very existence, I think, uh, helps to shore up these values and, and these norms. And to the extent that Taiwan can actively uh, support those norms and this idea of the commons, of the rule of law, I mean, all of this, all of that will help to shore up and sustain the liberal international order. And that's all to the good.
Thank you very much, Toshi. And now it's for audience Q&A. Uh, please state your name, uh, also your affiliation, uh, and please wait for uh, the microphone. Oh, we'll take a group of questions together. These gentlemen over here, please. Yep, we'll just take three questions. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, great uh, talk there. Um, it's been suggested uh, by someone that uh, uh, not just Mahan, but what, what the Chinese are doing is combining two uh, uh, theories that people thought were the, the opposing theories. Maybe the Mackinder with sort of continental power or the heartland, and then Mahan with the sea power. And so with the Chinese seem to be have come up with this concept that they can do uh, somehow both at once. Uh, did, did you get any flavor of that? In other words, it, even at a higher, a higher level than just the, the strategy for sea power? So you have the Maritime Silk Road, and then you have the road going through the middle of the uh, continent. So that's the question. Um, Peter Humphrey, uh, Intel analyst, a uh, former diplomat. Um, in its uh, complete failure to establish a civil defense system like Switzerland, uh, it seems Taiwan is living in some sort of fantasy world. Uh, it's very clear that Xi Jinping would love to make the acquisition of Taiwan his legacy. And he looks to the South China Sea and sees a profoundly lame response from the world. So given all this, what is keeping China from parking a few ships off of Senkaku's permanently and grabbing Kinmen and Matsu next month? Uh, Leo Bosner, former fellow here at GTI. My question is, to what extent can this coercive sea power backfire on the Chinese politically and economically if populations in other countries get less and less happy, like the folks in Vietnam who rioted against uh, the Chinese development, or if people in those other countries become less willing to buy stuff from China? And do the Chinese consider that? Okay, great, great questions. And I think in some ways they're all interrelated, and I, I'm going to try and tie them all together in one single answer. Uh, so, so firstly, uh, you know, I think what's important to know from a, from a theoretical perspective, guess, to the, to the geopolitical question about Mackinder and uh, Mahan is that what, what, what I've encountered is in some ways a, um, is, is a larger uh, renaissance of geopolitics in in China. And again, just, you know, as I said, there was an intellectual divergence certainly 10, 15 years ago about the importance of Mahan's writing, right? In the, in the West, sort of the West has gone into uh, what uh, Jeffrey Till has called the post-Mahanian world, just at a time where um, other emerging powers like China have embraced Mahan anew. Um, I think we could say roughly the same thing in terms of the intellectual divergence on geopolitics in general, right? Geopolitics in the West is seen as really old-fashioned, right? Who, who, you know, who talks about geopolitics and polite company, right? It's so 19th century, right? Uh, and yet we are, but, but, but what we've witnessed in China is this both an academic but a strategic renaissance in the study of geopolitics. Uh, translations of Mackinder's book, the translation of Speakman's book, uh, writings. Um, so that, that I think is the first broad point to make. The, the uh, second point uh, that's worth thinking about uh, is the fact that the, I think the Chinese are acutely aware of their geostrategic position and their geostrategic dilemmas. Uh, they describe uh, uh, themselves, China itself, as a classic hybrid land-sea power, meaning that it is a great power that uh, uh, has both continental and maritime commitments and liabilities, that it fronts both spheres at the same time. Uh, and that, again, being good history students, they've, they've done multiple studies on the rise and fall of great powers. What they have found uh, is that the historical record of hybrid land-sea powers has not been great, right? Um, land-sea powers that have sought supremacy at sea have frequently failed. Uh, think about Napoleonic France. Uh, think about Imperial Germany. Uh, think about um, the Soviet Union, for example, right? That, that countries that face both continental and maritime commitments frequently have to very carefully balance their resources against two very different kinds of challenges that requires two very different kinds of investments. I think the fact the Chinese, uh, apparently at least in their writing, seem so acutely aware of those dangers uh, 
tells me something about the quality of their strategic thought, firstly. Yet, at the same time, as, as you mentioned, there's clearly evidence uh, that uh, China's uh, ambitious plans for the Belt and Road Initiative could also potentially sow the seeds of overextension, right? The fact that China is going to invest vast amounts of resources into some of the most unstable, dangerous regions um, across Central Asia uh, is, is, could potentially be additional burdens and liabilities and commitments uh, that China cannot afford, especially over the long term, when China's economic trajectory is likely to flatten out even more than it is today. So thinking over the long term about the implications of those liabilities, I think, is, is um, absolutely critical. And to think about scenarios in which China could find itself overcommitted, overextended, not only in the continental direction, but even in the maritime direction, right? I mean, think about those access points that the Chinese have acquired. Uh, those are also potential liabilities. Or think about the, the island features the Chinese have built in the heart of the South China Sea. They're a thousand kilometers from the Chinese coastline, right? Uh, massive facilities that need to be resupplied, supported, maintained, and so forth. Those are all costs. Those are different kinds of liabilities, but they're liabilities nevertheless. So I think it, it, it is probably more productive not just to come up with the worst nightmare scenarios about what China might do if China were to succeed in the BRI, but also to consider all of the liabilities that they're likely to encounter in the interim, in the process of, of getting there. One final point about, about this, uh, to go back to the theory of Mackinder, is that what Mackinder was most worried about, he was describing the heartland power and the challenge that the heartland power would pose to the dominant maritime power of that age, which is Britain. What he was most concerned about was that if a true heartland power were to emerge that had both this heartland that, that was impregnable but also had conquered territories along the seaboard that gave this heartland power access to the seas, you would have for the first time a continental power that potentially could be impervious to the pressure and power of the sea power. That's what he was concerned about. And that seems to me is one of the underlying geostrategic logic of China's BRI, right? Should the continental routes be fulfilled. Let's take it to the extreme sort of endpoint, right, where China is successful. China now has found a formula for um, avoiding or substantially decreasing the amount of pressure that sea powers can apply to China. So I, to me, from a, from a Mackinder-esque perspective, the BRI project is a, is a high reward, potentially high reward, but also very high risk proposition again, for all of the reasons um, that, that I've laid out. And then to, to kind of um, address this issue of both um, what, what, um, why China isn't acting um, more aggressively because China could potentially be in a position to do so, and then this idea of backlash. I think they're you know, related, which is that, um, let me first of all talk about the Senkakus, I guess, which is that I, my main worry about the Senkakus uh, is that um, Japan might mistake what China is doing right now as a kind of a permanent new status quo, right? Which is this idea that as long as both sides pretend that they're engaged, you know, that 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 they each side is administering the water surrounding the islands, that 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 could be the permanent condition. My main concern is that as the physical maritime balance shifts increasingly towards China. Right, China has more material wherewithal um, to to deploy assets around the Senkakus, and, you know, and as you you know suggested, a, a permanent, potentially a permanent cordon around the Senkakus. Well, we're now inching towards China China having the option of creating a new status quo. So it seems to me that we can't sit back and say we don't have to worry about it anymore. This, this is the new status quo. It's, it's an uncomfortable one, but we can live with it. I think we need to anticipate uh, what, what might happen next. So I, you know, I think I want to address that issue first. So, so, so to, to think about China's Senkaku strategies as a potential interim strategy, rather than uh, sort of the ulti that, that what's happening now is al already the ultimate end state. Um, to the question of why China hasn't already acted um, more and this this uh, potential for backlash, you know, I think one of the key long-term strategic vulnerabilities of of China is the fact uh, 
that um, it doesn't have uh, very close friends and allies, high quality close friends and allies that it can count on when the chips are down. Uh, and it's one of the enduring strategic advantages that the United States enjoys, which is formal allied partners that are very high quality, that share the same values, that have been to the fight together before in, in the previous conflicts, and share the values and norms that bind them together. Uh, and that as China begins to push out, engage in the um, aggrandizement and um, aggressive behavior, what China is finding is uh, a coalescing of both informal and formal networks of relationships forming around China's immediate periphery. And I think um, this is one of the things, in my view, this asymmetric advantage on the part of the United States that is in some ways um, deterring China from um, doing even more than, than it has. And it has found out whether it's uh, the allied closing over the, uh, the uh, Huawei, right? Uh, if you think about uh, allied counteractions in other areas, is that China is finding that it can't afford to have too many fronts, contested fronts open up. Uh, and then one last point up, up about this from a geopolitical perspective is that not only is China a hybrid land sea power, China is surrounded by powerful neighbors that do not share the same view of the world. And just to put the, you know, to put the most simplest terms, it's surrounded by Russia, Japan, and India. India, in particular, it itself is a hybrid land-sea power that can put pressure on China both in a continental direction in, and in the maritime direction. So I think, and I think that the policy implication of that is that the United States needs to continue to cultivate those relationships and networks uh, that could create a, a, a kind of a galvanizing effect to bring all of these countries that share U.S. values um, and, and to push back against China um, across the board. Not just China's military modernization, but China's influence activities in Australia and in, and in Europe, China's economic predatory behavior in the Pacific and also in the uh, Indian Ocean littorals. I mean, all of that requires a, a collective response. And I think that's one of the key answers in, in in managing and responding to China's rise as a sea power. I would like to take one last round of questions. We're really over time, but um, one last round. So, uh, gentleman in the front over here. Uh, <clears throat> Richard Coleman, I'm retired from CBP. Uh, can you, and, I, and I granted it could only be a personal opinion of, of the inevitability, inevitability that the uh, rising capacities are going to get tested, and what would be the what would be the Chinese thinking currently as to the benefit? Are, uh, is it primarily eliminating a military threat, or do they see some potential future economic advantage from a, you know the smoldering remnants of what? They have? I am Garrett Vanderweis. I teach history of. Taiwan at George Mason University. Uh, my question basically ties in with the land versus sea power debate uh, that you just outlined. Uh, back in the 15th century, uh, China was a major sea power, uh, only for a very short period of time though, during the Ming Dynasty, uh, Yonghe. Uh, he had, I think, uh, sh huge ships that basically dwarfed uh, Columbus's ships, and he went as far away uh, as Africa. So for that very short period of time, China was out there, but it suddenly stopped. And basically because China reverted to its old self of being a continental, of a land power, uh, what makes you think that this time it is different? Can you outline uh, the reasons why this might be different from mm -hmm. last time around? Sure. So I'll start with your question. Ultimately, is what, what does China want? I, you know, I think... It's not what China wants, it's what the Chinese Communist Party wants. And I think ultimately that gives us a better sense of what, what the ultimate end state. And the, the bottom line, of course, is regime survival, right? Is the long-term longevity, the sustainability of the regime. And, and it will do whatever that's required to do so. Um, just to quote uh, 
Princeton scholar Aaron Freeberg, I love the phrase that he uses, right, which is um, that what China is trying to do externally is to make the world safe for authoritarianism, right? Is to create a favorable balance of power, both in terms of physical power, but also ideological power, that creates realignments in the external environment, principally in Asia, but beyond, in a way that compels external actors to essentially accept the nature of the regime that exists in Beijing today. And I think that, that, that may be one way of thinking about what does China want, right? China wants a favorable strategic balance of power because it wants to keep the United States at bay, not just for the military challenge, but for the ideological challenge that the United States represents as a democracy. That is why China has gone to great lengths to coerce Australia, to try to coerce Taiwan through influence operations. Um, it, it's, it's, it's again to, to restructure the region and of the regional system in a way that um, sustains the regime. Um, so I think that's one, one way of thinking about what does China want. And I think that's what the China dream is about as well, right? By 2050, Xi Jinping doesn't envision <laughs> the Communist Party going away in any time soon. In fact, it is a revitalized Chinese Communist Party that stands at the helm and maintains a monopoly of political power by mid-century. And that's essential to understanding the China dream. Now, to get back to your point about um, because of China's previous failure, what, what, what makes us think that China will succeed? Um, I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, so of course China's strategic success is not guaranteed. Strategic su you know, success is never guaranteed. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the key variables um, to think about is the fact that this is in some ways an anomaly in Chinese strategic history that there's been a period in which China has not had to deal with a continental, an existential continental threat to its north and northwest, right? And this is part of why Chinese leaders since Jiang Zemin has talked about this period of strategic opportunity. From a geostrategic perspective, part of that strategic opportunity is that it has not had to deal with a security challenge to the north and northwest that has uh, dogged Chinese security planners since antiquity, right? From the nomads of the Central Asian steppes all the way to the Soviet Union. It has always had to prioritize and be preoccupied with the threat to the north. With that having um, abated in the post-Cold War period, this is what has given China the luxury of being able to devote all of its resources in the aerospace and maritime domain. So we do have to think about this in terms of a strategic window of opportunity. And the question is, when might that window close? Or to put, to, or to put it another way, how long will that window stay open in the coming years? But the other thing that we highlight in, in the book uh, is the, the, the economic geography of China. Is that because of the reform and opening up period, what we witnessed was a massive demographic uh, transformation of China where people uh, flocked to the uh, coastal areas, into the urban centers to look for jobs and into manufacturing. And what we see is the formation of three massive economic blocks along the Chinese coast. One in the Bohai economic rim to the north, centered on Beijing and Tianjin. One in the middle part of the coast, centered on the uh, Yangtze River Delta economic zone, centered on Shanghai, and even as far west as Nanjing. And then to the south, the Pearl River Delta economic zone, centered on Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou. Just that Pearl River Delta economic zone, depending on how you carve the boundaries, there are approximately 46 million people living in that coastal enclave, right? These have become uh, critical political, economic, cultural centers of China along the coast. And that they are essential to not only China's economic well-being, but also the long-term sustainment of the regime. And that then explains why Chinese now say, we no longer front the land and, and, back, and have our backs to the sea. Today, we have our back to the land and front to the sea. That we are, in some ways, uh, permanently committed to the maritime domain because that is the source of not only China's prosperity but at the root of the survival of the Chinese communist regime. The, the, the very fate of the regime now is tied in some ways to the maritime domain. This should, so without getting into probabilities of whether China will succeed or not, I think what it highlights is uh, that there are tremendous strategic incentives for the regime to continue to invest in the maritime and aerospace domain. Its fate remains unknown, 
of, of course, and, and, and probabilities of success is also difficult to measure. But I think I, I can certainly say with confidence, again, that China's turn to the sea, seas will be a long-term factor, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Well, with that, Toshi, please join me in thanking Toshi for this fascinating and enriching discussion.